in three days, God will die. In three days, Jesus will be brought through mock trial upon mock trial. He will be beaten with rods. He will be whipped with what was called a cat of nine tails. It was intended to rip the flesh off of your body. He will be mock worshiped by those he came to save. The only one who's worthy of worship will be mocked in an act of false worship. And then a mob with mob mentality will shout and command, crucify, let his blood be on us and our children. And ultimately he will walk to Golgotha, the place of the skull where he will be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities where Christ God himself will die. In three days, God will die. Today, as we continue our series in the book of Mark, we're in the last week of Jesus' life. And many of the commentaries I read on the passage we're gonna be reading today in Mark chapter 11 and chapter 12, put this story three days before the crucifixion. And my hope as we finish out the book of Mark through the rest of this year and the beginning of next year, is that we would make much of Jesus, that we would fix our eyes upon him as we watch his resilient march towards Calvary. So a little bit of background as we, uh, before we jump into the passage. Last week, Pastor Drew taught about a passage that had much fanfare, the triumphal entry, where it's just this crazy scene where Jesus is coming into town on a donkey and the crowds go wild, ripping branches off of trees and throwing them on the ground, shouting at him, Hosanna, save us now. And there's much celebration. There's be, much is being made of Jesus' entry into the town. And we know from the gospel of Luke that Jesus is having a totally contrasting experience to what the crowds are experiencing. They're shouting praise and adulation on Jesus as he enters. And we know from the book of Luke that as Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, he wept over it. The word there in the original language that Drew read last week, it means to sob or wail aloud. This is an ugly cry. Think snot coming out, red puffy eyes, tears streaming down your face. He wailed aloud because he knew as he entered Jerusalem, their hearts were still far from him. And as he enters in, he goes to the temple, the place that he went often. He often taught in the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, Solomon's porch, the court of Israel. He taught in all these varied places because he wanted the message of the good news of his salvation that he was bringing to be proclaimed to everybody. And as he enters the temple, what does he see? But that this place of worship and prayer where the Gentiles could come into, the court of the Gentiles has been turned into a thoroughfare and a marketplace where uh, money changers were selling animals at exorbitant prices so that that people could sacrifice them in the temple. And zeal for his father's house consumes him. He comes back the next day and he drives people out of the temple, overturning the tables of the money changers. And this moment enrages the religious leaders. They're angry with him because they're the ones who allowed this to happen. And they're thinking, we're the religious leaders. Who do you think you are coming in here and upending how we're running the temple? But they're also angry with him for a bit more of a shady reason. You see, many commentators and scholars believe that what was happening in the court of Gentiles where people were uh, selling the animals that the religious leaders would have profited off of that by charging a fee in order for uh, the money changers to do that. And so Jesus has not only subverted their authority, he has messed with their pocketbook and they're enraged and they're looking for a way to destroy him. That's the context with which we enter into our passage today. Verse 27, Mark 11. And they came again to Jerusalem and he was, out, he was walking in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. So he comes back into Jerusalem. He's in the temple again, the place where he just overturned tables and ran everybody out. 
and the religious leaders, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders come to him. Now, this is the group that made up what was called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is like the high court of Israel, the supreme court of Israel that oversaw matters of religion and law. And so they come to him and they've got some questions. Remember, these guys are pretty uh, peeved with Jesus at this moment. They come to him and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority? They're saying, look, we're the authority here. They were what was called the Sanhedrin, which was 70 people plus the, the high priest, 71 people. And I don't, I don't know if it's all of them that have come to Jesus in this moment or just a few representatives, but they come to Jesus and they say, look, we didn't give you the authority to do what you did. Who do you think you are? By what authority do you do these things? And we know from, uh, from history that religious leaders and rabbis would, uh, when they wanted to speak or do things authoritatively, they would often reference somebody who had more authority than them. And so they're saying, by whose authority did you do this? And Jesus responds, Jesus said to them, verse 29, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. As I've been studying this passage, a a phrase that uh, Jordan, the worship director in Sutherland said uh, a a year ago, almost in January, when I taught with him has been ringing out in my mind. He said, Jesus isn't just the King of Kings. He's the genius of geniuses. And we're going to see Jesus take their question, flip it on its head and throw the tension back right where it belongs. So Jesus says, I'm going to ask you one question. Answer me and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. And here's his question. Verse 30, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now, if you don't know who John is, John the Baptist, he had a ministry that was uh, the baptism of repentance. This is Jesus' cousin on his mama's side. And he was the forerunner of Jesus who came to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so he was calling Israel, calling God's people to repent and come back to God. And he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. And so Jesus says, was his ministry from heaven or was it a man-made construct? Was it from God or was it illegitimate? Answer me, he says, verse 31. And they discussed it with one another saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man, they were, afraid of for, they were afraid of the people for they all held that John really was a prophet. Jesus just drops a dilemma right in their lap. Okay. And they're, they're debating amongst each other. Okay. If we say John's ministry was legit and that he was from heaven, we're going to have to own up to rejecting a prophet of God. That's not going to go well for us. If we say that his ministry was God given, we have to own up publicly to the reality that we rejected him because this is, this question was done in a public setting in the, in the temple courts. They're trying to trap Jesus in his own words and Jesus has put the tension back where it belongs. And so they're saying, if we say this, it won't go well for us. They're gonna know that we've rejected someone who came from God. But if we say it was from man and it was an illegitimate ministry, look at what Mark says here. They were afraid of the people. Now notice that's not in quotations. That's not a direct quote from the Sanhedrin as they're discussing this. This is an annotation that Mark puts in there about their motive. They don't want to say that John's ministry was from man and an illegitimate thing, because if they do so, they know that the people that they lead and have control and power and authority over will be riled up because many of them believed that John really was a prophet. Probably many of them were baptized by him. And so they're stuck in this dilemma. As they try to trap Jesus, Jesus has caught them in their own trap. He's the genius of geniuses. Verse 33, so they answered Jesus, we do not know. (laughs) We do not know. Like they're just feigning ignorance. I don't know, you know, we're kind of undecided on this. And I wish I could be a fly on the wall of the temple in this moment. Like, Here's Jesus and these religious leaders. And how are they having this conversation with Jesus right there? Are are they like whispering or like they giving the eyeballs? Like, you know, if we say this and that's going to happen. Like, what did this actually look like? But ultimately they say, we don't know. This is their job. The job of the Sanhedrin was to make sure that people who claimed to come from God were legit or illegitimate. They, They would have been people who investigated these sorts of claims. 
That's the very reason why they're asking Jesus about his authority in the first place. On the surface, this looks like a legitimate question, but there are undercurrents that are fueling it that they really want to destroy him by trapping him in his own words. And so they say, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now on the surface, it could look like Jesus is just avoiding the question. But in reality, their answer to the question of Jesus answers the question that they asked in the first place. Because if John's baptism was legitimately from heaven and John's ministry was from God, that means what John had to say about Jesus is also true. And what did John say about Jesus? He is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He told his disciples, go and follow him. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. Okay. And so he knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, and therefore has all authority to come into the temple and overturn tables and, and chase the money changers out of there because he's God. If they honestly answered the question Jesus gave them, their original question would have been answered as well. But they refuse. In their spiritual blindness and hard heartedness, they refuse to acknowledge the authority of Jesus. Let's look at it here again in the passage. They say, By what authority are you doing these things? The word there in the original language is exousia, exousia. It does not mean just like leadership acumen or influence. Exousia can be literally translated power. What power do you think you have that we don't have? We're the ruling body over the Jews. We oversee matters of religion and law, and we did not give you the okay to come in here and do this. In fact, this was our doing. We allowed people to use the court of the Gentiles as a thoroughfare and a marketplace. Who do you think you are? What exousia, what power, what authority do you think you have? Now think about Jesus' ministry. What authority did he have? People were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one who had authority in and of himself. His ministry was marked by authority authority over demons and the demonically oppressed. He just, with a word, could cast them out. He had authority over the wind. Like, who is this that has power over nature? And if they're honest, they already have heard the answer to this question. In Jesus' teachings in the temple and, and all over the place, he has claimed to be one come from God who speaks with power and authority. He's claimed divinity. They know the answer to this, but in their hard hearted and spiritual blind rejection of Jesus, they refuse to submit to his authority. And this is an outright and blatant attempt to do so. They're in the public. They say, who do you think you are, Jesus? We're the leaders here. We have control. You see, they do it very publicly, but God's people still reject Jesus' authority. And often it looks a lot more covert It looks like placing our hope in other authorities. And I want to say this carefully, but on the other side of an election, if you were despondent at who entered into the White House or overjoyed at who entered the White House, could it be that you have placed your hope in an authority that is not Christ? Because regardless of what politicians are in power, what kings, queens, prince and princesses are ruling or what president is in the White House, God is on the throne and he has not given up his power. He has not given up his authority. So could it be that you have misplaced your hope in other lesser authorities? in the world, earthly authorities. Jesus is the cosmic CEO. He has all authority. So are you submitted to his authority? Another way that we often in a more hidden way are not submitted to Jesus' authority is selective obedience. I read the scriptures and I see sin in the scripture that I actually enjoy. And so I'm going to ignore that part of the scripture because it doesn't line up with my lifestyle. Are you selective in where you will obey Jesus? 
Jesus was very clear at the end of his uh, earthly ministry, towards the end of his earthly ministry, as he, on the other side of the cross and the resurrection, about his authority. He's resurrected. He, he comes to his disciples. Some of them are, are worshiping. Others are doubting. And here's what he says. Jesus came to them and said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. That doesn't leave any wiggle room. And then he delineates in the heavenly realms and in the earthly realm. In the heavenly realms, God, Jesus has all authority. That's why crazy, freaky creatures fly around the throne of God with eyeballs all over them, shouting, holy, 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 because Jesus has all authority in the heavenly realms. On the earth, Jesus says one day there will be a day where every single knee will bow in submission to him. Some in worship and adoration and others in judgment. Jesus has all authority and the only proper response to one who has all authority is total surrender. So are you submitted to Jesus? Have you surrendered control of your life to him? You see, one of the number one things I hear when when people struggle with following Jesus is I just don't want to give up control. Listen, I've got bad news for you. You never had control in the first place. You never had control in the first place. Scripture says we're we're what's called a slave. The only question is, who's your master? You don't have control. You and I, we are a slave and we will be a slave either to sin, which always leads to death. It looks good, it's alluring, it's tempting, but it always leads to death. And we will be a slave to sin and we will obey that master. And it looks like freedom. And Satan is totally fine with you thinking that you have control, but really you're a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. And submission to Christ's rulership or lordship over you always leads to true life, always. And so the question isn't, I want to maintain control. That's why I don't want to submit to Jesus. It's no, we've never had control in the first place. We are slaves to one of these two things. Who is your master? And I think often when we look at words like authority, I don't know about you, but I get jaded to that word. I have seen so many bad examples of authority displayed in the world, from politicians to presidents to church leaders and pastors. We have examples of scandal. We have examples of people trying to get their own needs met in selfish and unhealthy ways by wielding their power. Jesus' power is not like that. Jesus' power is the power that sets sinners free from bondage. It's the authority that makes a way to God where there was no way. Jesus' power and authority is for you, but he is the authority. And one day we will all stand before him and he will judge the nations. And the question that is going to be on his lips is, did you surrender? What did you do with my Lordship? Did you recognize me as Lord of your life? The scriptures know nothing about Jesus just being savior and not being Lord. Jesus is your personal savior. Yes, but he's also your personal Lord. So have you submitted to Christ? In this moment, these religious leaders clearly have not. He's exercised his authority in the temple and they are frustrated and infuriated because they, have, they believe he has usurped their authority, their control. And then Jesus entreats them with a parable. Continuing on in the passage, Mark 12, starting in verse one. And he began to speak to them in parables. Now, uh, before, we move up, uh, before we move too far into this passage, I wanna remind us what a parable is because this is often where interpretive issues come in. So a parable is an earthly story that communicates a spiritual truth. It's a very common, practical, everyday story that communicates a heavenly reality, okay? So when he speaks to them in parables, and we've seen this earlier in the book of Mark, but when he speaks to them in parables, generally speaking, you're not supposed to dissect every single detail of a parable. 
You want to look at what is the over arc of the point of the parable. And that's a general rule. As you're interpreting the Bible, as you're doing your own Bible reading, when you come across the parable, you ask yourself, what is the spiritual truth that this earthly story is communicating? Don't get lost in the details. However, with this particular parable, there is more meaning in the details than most of Jesus' other parables. And we'll look at that. So again, he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went into another country. So this is a very common practice. This happened all the time. Landowners would do everything necessary to create a vineyard and make it so that it could be fruitful. He puts a fence around it to keep the wild animals out that might destroy the crop. He he puts a tower in it for security and a place to store the product. He he, uh, digs a pit for the wine press to, to make sure they can produce the product. And then he puts tenants in the property to care for and produce the fruit. Verse two, when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. So this is also a very common practice. He owns the land. He would have had a contract with the tenants. They get a portion of the the produce, the product, and so does he. And so he's sending his servant. And as the religious leaders in the temple court with Jesus, as he's telling them this story, they would have been tracking with it all along. Oh yeah, I, I know that. That's a common practice. My buddy Joe, he does that. And so they would have tracked right along with Jesus up until this next verse. As the vineyard owner sends a servant, look at verse three. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed scandal enters the parable. Took him, they beat him. The vineyard owner had every right to send someone to make demands of these tenants. It's his property. And they beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. So they've upped the ante now. Not only did they beat him, but they treated him shamefully. And the word there in the original language is the same word that's used in Romans 1 of sexual depravity but it gets worse. And he sent another and him they killed. They've, they've murdered now all of a desire to not give to the vineyard owner what is rightfully his. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent to him, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So the father, the, 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 the vineyard owner, owner sends his son and uh, he says, look, they have treated my servant shamefully, but this is my heir. This is my son. He has every right, familial right to come and make demands of these tenants. He must be treated with respect and they conspire to kill him so that they can receive the inheritance. Verse eight, and they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. They don't even give him a burial. They throw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Jesus asks as he finishes the parable. He asks a rhetorical question to these religious leaders who just heard this scandalous story. Can you believe this is what happened? What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. So let's unpack what we just went through. The vineyard owner is God, the father. And the vineyard that God has planted is his people, Israel. And just like the vineyard owner did everything for the flourishing of his crop, of his product. So God, the father has done everything for the flourishing and fruitful production of his people, Israel. He, he <clears throat> has protected them and provided for them. He placed tenants in and among them. That's the religious leaders who were supposed to point them to God and point them to God's way and call them to repentance. And yet that didn't happen. And we know throughout Israel's history, God continually sent prophets. That's the servants in this story. And the prophets would come with a word of judgment or rebuke from God often. And what did Israel do in the religious leadership? They treated the prophets shamefully, beating them, persecuting them for the word of the Lord, sometimes killing them. And so finally, the vineyard owner, after sending many 
prophets. The father, after sending many prophets to his people, sends his son. And the, the words that he uses is his beloved son. The same words that are used of Jesus at his baptism and at the transfiguration. He sends his beloved son. And what do they do? They conspire to kill him, which is what we saw these very people, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the religious leadership, last chapter, they were conspiring to kill Jesus. They, they said, I want to destroy him. And then they kill him. And at that point, the parable shifts from a story to more like prophetic teaching of Jesus about what is coming, that he will die. He's not unaware of what awaits him in the near future. That by these tenants, these religious leaders, he will die. And then he asks them a a rhetorical question here at the end, verse 10. Have you not read this scripture? Now, of course they read this scripture. They would have probably had this scripture memorized. His question is not just, have you not read the words of it, but do you not understand the meaning of it? And here's the scripture. This is a reference to Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus points them to their own scripture to say, this is about me. I am the cornerstone. I am the stone by which every other stone in the foundation and the building is set and measured. I create a firm foundation on which God is building. And yet you have rejected me. And I have become the cornerstone. Verse 12, in response to all this teaching, the parable and all of it, Verse 12, and they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. So they came face to face with the truth about themselves and they reject him. This is the ultimate rejection of Jesus. Jesus teaches them truth in a parable format about their own hearts, their own hard-hearted refusal to submit to his authority and rejection of him in spiritual blindness. They reject Jesus and ultimately decide, come, let us kill him. They, They conspire to murder God. And then they ultimately carry it out by killing him this will happen in three days time on the cross. And here in this moment, they have rejected Jesus, the only one who can soften their hearts. Think about this with me. These are religious leaders who would have had vast portions of the Old Testament memorized. The word of God, which points to the son of God. They're in the temple courts whose very architecture, furniture, and practices through the sacrifices all points to the son of God. They're wearing the robes of the priests of God, which even the colors on their robes pointed to the ultimate death of God, the son of God. They're surrounded by everything that would point them to Jesus. And here Jesus is standing right in front of them. And not only do they not recognize him, they reject him. This is hard hearted rebellion and rejection of Jesus. And Jesus has a sober warning for those who persist in hard hearted rebellion and rejection. Look at what he tells them. What will the owner of the vineyard do? That's the father. He will come and destroy the tenants. That's the religious leaders in their hard hearted rejection of the son of God and give the vineyard to others. Now, many scholars make much of this, um, that this is a reference to the reality that the Gentiles will be brought in and God's people will no longer just be Israel, but God's people, the church. They also reference that this is a reference to the destruction of the temple and God's people being more than just Israel. And so here he says, there there is judgment that comes in rejecting the only one who can save you from the wrath of God. So I want to come back to our question, are you submitted to Jesus or have you rejected him? There's only two types of people in the world. There are those who have received Jesus, 
who have repented of their sin. That's simply a turning from it and to God in belief, belief in Christ. And they have been, they've been, they've entered into the family of God. They become children of God, accepted and loved and forgiven, not because of anything they did, but because of what Jesus did. But there's another type of people in the world. Those who refuse to submit to the authority of God and reject Jesus. And those people, Jesus says, there is judgment coming. One day we will stand before God and he will ask you, what did you do with my son? Did you submit to his lordship or not? There is no middle ground and there is no neutral territory in Jesus. The only logical response to one who has all authority is total surrender. And so maybe you're here today and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. Here's what this looks like. It's a recognition that you're a sinner just like me and that you need a savior. And it is a decision to turn from your sin and trust in something far greater than your sin. Jesus, who brings life. Where your sin brings death, Jesus brings life. Surrender to him and begin that process of living in submission to him. It will look differently 10 years from now than it does today, but begin today. And maybe you're here and you're a follower of Jesus. I just, I would ask you, are you, are there areas of your life you're not submitted to Christ's authority, that you're not submitted to Christ's leadership of your life? And if so, have gracious curiosity about why. Why am I not surrendered? Why am I not submitted? And Lord, help me to have the faith to sub- surrender and submit in those places. And for those of us who are trying, we're, we're on the mission to make disciples Every time we share the gospel, we put this tension on people. Will you submit to the authority of Jesus? That's ultimately what a disciple is, one who has submitted to the authority of Jesus and therefore values him and is transformed by him over time. So as you're making disciples, Don't let anything get in the way of that call, the gospel call to repentance and faith. Repentance and faith, a turning from sin and trusting in Jesus. The gospel call to lay down my life, give up control and surrender to God. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I'm gonna release to the campuses. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. Uh, it, I, I, I want to just kind of nail down on one question. And it's a question I asked several times throughout the message. Are you submitted to Jesus? What truly is the authority in your life? Where has your hope been placed? Have you placed it in earthly authorities? That's an indicator that maybe you, you're not trusting in Jesus. You've not, there's an area of your life that has not been submitted to him. Or maybe you're selectively obeying his word and you're viewing yourself as the authority. I like this, I don't like that. What is the authority in your life? Where does your hope lie? Be graciously curious for yourself about that question today. And I encourage you, if, if you have family members, a spouse uh, or kids, if, you're, if you wanna talk with your parents or if you don't have a family around you tr- with trusted friends, Wrestle with this question in community. Ask others that you trust and you know love you. What, is the, what, do you, what do you see the authority in my life to be? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the truth of your word, that you love us as we are, and yet you love us too much to leave us in that space. God, I pray for those of us who are wrestling with the idea of submission Maybe it's submission for the first time. God, I pray you would draw those people to yourself, that they would truly seek you and ultimately surrender to the authority, the lordship of Jesus. And God, if your people who truly have relationship with you have realized by the power of the Holy Spirit today that there are some areas of their life that they are not submitted. Lord, I pray that you would help them to see that with clarity 
and help them to surrender those spaces. Give them the faith and the grace to live submitted to Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I love you. Enjoy your Sunday.